the intellectual foundations of astrology were swept away 300 years ago. And yet, astrology is still taken seriously by a great many people. Have you ever noticed how easy it is to find a magazine on astrology? Virtually every newspaper in America has a daily column on astrology. Almost none of them have even a weekly column on astronomy. People wear astrological pendants, check their horoscopes before leaving the house. Even our language preserves an astrological consciousness. For example, take the word disaster. It comes from the Greek for bad star. The Italians once believed that disease was caused by the influence of the stars. It's the origin of our word influenza. The zodiacal signs used by astrologers even ornament this statue of Prometheus in New York City. Prometheus who stole fire from the gods. What is all this astrology business? Fundamentally, it's the contention that which constellations the planets are in at the moment of your birth profoundly influences your future. A few thousand years ago, the idea developed that the motions of the planets determine the fates of kings, dynasties, empires. Astrologers studied the motions of the planets and asked themselves what had happened last time that, say, Venus was rising in the constellation of the goat. Maybe something similar would happen this time as well. It was a subtle and risky business. Astrologers became employed only by the state. In many countries, it became a capital offense for anyone but the official astrologer to read the portents in the skies. Why? Because a good way to overthrow a regime was to predict its downfall. Chinese court astrologers who made inaccurate predictions were executed. Others simply doctored the records so that afterwards they were in perfect conformity with events. Astrology developed into a strange discipline, a mixture of careful observations, mathematics and record keeping with fuzzy thinking and pious fraud. Nevertheless, astrology survived and flourished. Why? Because it seems to lend a cosmic significance to the routine of our daily lives. It pretends to satisfy our longing to feel personally connected with the universe. Astrology suggests a dangerous fatalism. If our lives are controlled by a set of traffic signals in the sky, why try to change anything? Here, look at this. Here's two different newspapers published in the same city on the same day. Let's, uh, let's see what they do about astrology. Suppose you were a Libra that is born between September 23rd and October 22nd. According to the astrologer for the New York Post, a uh, compromise will help ease tension. Well, maybe, it's sort of vague. According to the New York Daily News' astrologer, demand more of yourself. Well, also vague, but also pretty different. It's interesting that these predictions are not predictions. They tell you what to do. They don't say what's going to happen. They're consciously designed to be so vague that it could apply to anybody, and they disagree with each other. Astrology can be tested by the lives of twins. There are many real cases like this. One twin is killed in childhood in, say, a riding accident or is struck by lightning, but the other lives to a prosperous old age. Suppose that happened to me. My twin and I would be born in precisely the same place and within minutes of each other. Exactly the same planets would be rising at our births. If astrology were valid, how could we have such profoundly different fates? It turns out that astrologers can't even agree among themselves what a given horoscope means. In careful tests, they're unable to predict the character and future of people they know nothing else about except the time and place of birth. Also, how could it possibly work? How could the rising of Mars at the moment of my birth affect me? 
then or now. I was born in a closed room. Light from Mars couldn't get in. The only influence of Mars which could affect me was its gravity. But the gravitational influence of the obstetrician was much larger than the gravitational influence of Mars. Mars is a lot more massive, but the obstetrician was a lot closer. The desire to be connected with the cosmos reflects a profound reality. For we are connected, not in the trivial ways that the pseudoscience of astrology promises, but in the deepest ways. Our little planet is under the influence of a star. The sun warms us, it drives the weather, it sustains all living things. Four billion years ago, it brought forth life on Earth. But our sun is only one of a billion trillion stars within the observable universe. And those countless suns all obey natural laws, some of which are already known to us. How did we discover that there are such laws? If we lived on a planet where nothing ever changed, there wouldn't be much to do. There'd be nothing to figure out. There'd be no impetus for science. And if we lived in an unpredictable world, where things changed in random or very complex ways, we wouldn't be able to figure things out. And again, there'd be no such thing as science. But we live in an in-between universe, where things change all right, but according to patterns, rules, or as we call them, laws of nature. If I throw a stick up in the air, it always falls down. If the sun sets in the west, it always rises again the next morning in the east. And so it's possible to figure things out. We can do science, and with it, we can improve our lives. Human beings are good at understanding the world. We always have been. We were able to hunt game or build fires only because we had figured something out. There once was a time before television, before motion pictures, before radio, before books. The greatest part of human existence was spent in such a time. And then, over the dying embers of the campfire, on a moonless night, we watched the stars. The night sky is interesting. There are patterns there. If you look closely, you can see pictures. One of the easiest constellations to recognize lies in the northern skies. In North America, it's called the Big Dipper. The French have a similar idea. They call it la casserole, the casserole. In medieval England, the same pattern of stars reminded people of a simple wooden plow. The ancient Chinese had a more sophisticated notion. To them, these stars carried the celestial bureaucrat on his rounds about the pole of the sky, seated on the clouds and accompanied by his eternally hopeful petitioners. The people of Northern Europe imagined yet another pattern. To them, it was Charles's wain or wagon, a medieval cart. But other cultures saw these seven stars as part of a larger picture. It was the tail of a great bear, which the ancient Greeks and Native Americans saw instead of the handle of a dipper. 
But surely the most imaginative interpretation of this larger group of stars was that of the ancient Egyptians. They made out a curious procession of a bull and a reclining man, followed by a strolling hippopotamus with a crocodile on its back. What a marvelous diversity in the images various cultures saw in this particular constellation. But the same is true for all the other constellations. Some people think these things are really in the night sky, but we put these pictures there ourselves. We were hunter folk. So we put hunters and dogs, lions and young women up in the skies. All manner of things of interest to us. When 17th century European sailors first saw the southern skies, they put all sorts of things of 17th century interest up there. Microscopes and telescopes, compasses and the sterns of ships. If the constellations had been named in the 20th century, I suppose we'd put their refrigerators and bicycles, rock stars, maybe even mushroom clouds. A new set of human hopes and fears placed among the stars. But there's more to the stars than just pictures. For example, stars always rise in the east and always set in the west, taking the whole night to cross the sky if they pass overhead. There are different constellations in different seasons. The same constellations always rise at, say, the beginning of autumn. It never happens that a new constellation suddenly appears out of the east, one that you never saw before. There's a regularity, a permanence, a predictability about the stars. In a way, they're almost comforting.